for years now, we've been asking, where is the industry itself standing up for children? Where, where are the people who, are, who have devoted their lives to the wellness of kids to push back on the madness? And it seems like you guys were asking yourselves that same question. Well, it's very difficult to speak out when you're a lone voice and you get told you're a transphobic bigot, even for asking what would be considered very conventional psychotherapeutic questions. And so an awful lot of therapists like myself and Joe and others have been silenced in a way that I had never experienced in my life before. Usually psychotherapists aren't really in the middle of the media or talking about controversial topics. Usually we're boring people about deep psychological analysis. Mm -hmm. And yet in this world, in this extraordinary world where mental distress has been weaponized into uh, a, a, a kind of something to bludgeon people with and silence people with. It's just become a, a, a horrendous issue. And these are the most vulnerable kids. These are the autistic kids, kids who might one day grow up to be gay or lesbian. These are really, really vulnerable kids. It's the savvy kids aren't getting caught up in this. It's the lost, vulnerable, sad kids that are getting lost in this. Mm, whole that's thing. a good point. Joe, tell me, because you're a psychotherapist, was there a period during which you were asking yourself the same questions I was just espousing out loud? Like, it, like, what are we doing? What is happening? This is madness. Was there a, a whisper campaign amongst people in your field about what are we doing? I had a more personal entry into this field. I had a, a child at the age of 14 trans identify. This was 10 years ago before any of this was on the radar. So I and I went through all of this firsthand as a parent, couldn't find support in the psychotherapeutic community, was basically treated with contempt by the medical community. And I, I kind of went away. My child alienated herself from her family eventually. And I went away for a long time until I couldn't I couldn't just sit by any longer. So I started looking around for people who were trying to offer something other than affirmative care. And that's when I found, I found Geta, I found Sasha Ayad, Lisa Marciano, and Stella, and originally joined one organization where Stella and I met and then um, signed on with Genspect when I found there were other people like me who were, who were trying to offer something different. Mm, you must have been so relieved to find other people who, you know, seemed reasonable, right? Just not not so agenda driven. Right. Totally. Totally. And people who, I mean, therapists, the great thing is meeting other therapists who actually still believe in doing therapy. You know, that if somebody is genuinely distressed about feeling like she's a boy in a girl's body, well, th there's, there's some issues there that need to be explored. It's obviously genuine, this distress, but it, it doesn't require affirmation and support for this I, I call it a delusional belief system. It's the, the distress is real and they need real help. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you guys came together. Stella, you what, talk about your origins and in getting into the group and finding yourself pushing back against the, all of this. Well, I kind of, I had an unusual kind of route in as well. When I was a kid for very many years, as a very young kid from the age of about three, right up through puberty. So for many, many years, I was the classic kind of childhood onset gender dysphoria. It would have been called gender identity disorder back when I was a kid. And um, I, I certainly wasn't affirmed. Nobody was affirmed back then. I was seen as a very odd kid and I was a very odd kid. I was also an unhappy kid, but I was very, very insistent and persistent and consistent as the clinicians seek these days to find out whether they should block children's puberty. And it, it was the process of puberty that brought me out of a wretched, depressing experience of my childhood. So it kind of rejected myself in the most fundamental way for many, many, many years, all through my childhood. I wanted to be a boy. I was sure I should be a boy. I was better as a boy. I made everybody see me as a boy. I was very insistent and intense about it. Then puberty came and with puberty comes a sexual awakening. And that sexual awakening takes years. You know what I mean? Especially for a girl. I think I think with a boy, it seems to come in like a rocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a girl, it's, it's it's a subtler, longer affair in many ways. But certainly it wasn't actually that subtle for me. But I certainly the the arrival of sexual awakening, fancying other people, 
realizing that I had to stop thinking of myself and start thinking about myself in terms of other people for relationships. That was the process that brought me out of gender dysphoria. So when uh, I first heard about the idea of blocking children's puberty, I literally stood still in the street saying, oh, you can't do that. That's blocking the very thing that will actually help these kids. Difficult as it was, and I don't want to under undermine these kids' experiences. Honestly, my, my puberty was harrowing. It was a train wreck. It was a terrible time. But it was what I needed to go through to come out the other side. Many years later, I became a psychotherapist and learned the value of sometimes you do need to go through things to get a deeper understanding to come through it. And then some years after that, I was invited to take part in a a film actually called Trans Kids. It's time to talk. This is 2018. Um, And we the the concept of the film was just to ask, could any of the 4000 percent rise in female adolescents seeking medical transition? Could any of them be like me and actually be better off? going through puberty naturally, having a sexual awakening, becoming a woman and becoming very happy. I, you know, one of the most important, well, probably the most important part of me is that I'm a mother. And had I transitioned, had I been offered puberty blockers, I would have grabbed them from anybody who offered them to me. Mm. And uh, I would have sought medical transition. And so I have a quite a deep understanding of what it's like to to experience it. But I also think it's really, really important that we don't let children lead. It's more important for the adults in the room to take the responsibility, and it can be hard, to be actually, let's say, child-centred but adult-led. These days, the affirmative approach is child-led. And so the child is literally leading all the adults in the room about when to change their name, what toilets to use, what sports team they should go on, what pronouns they should use. And kids can't take that much responsibility. It's too much power and they're too immature. You know, as we, I assume you guys were not sitting around watching our first hour, but the, <laughs> I'm sensing a theme because we were talking about some of the madness on college campuses and how students at Stanford are now demanding that the university denounce Israel and um, issue statements asking for a ceasefire. They're, they want Stanford University to put out a statement saying that. And they're demanding 24-7 trauma counselors for themselves. And it really is, it to me, I see a common theme here where we're just over and over ceding authority to kids. And now by the time they get to Stanford, to Stanford they're drunk on their own power. They're used yeah. to having adults bend the knee to them. Like, yes, that they are in charge. They're gonna make the decisions as opposed to, I think when the three of us were coming up where you understood adults were the authority figures. And here and there you'd push back and you'd test the limits, but you understood who had the final say and it wasn't you. And I know that you've written and and you guys both feel the thing about puberty, that it's, it's actually a human right, that puberty is a human right. And that this so-called pause, this, this like harmless pause that you get with puberty blockers is anything but. I, I think it's a very insidious thing to do, to to block somebody's sexual awakening, especially when children who have, you know, gender dysphoria are around about 70 to 80 percent more likely to be gay. So the the little kids like me, I actually turned out to be heterosexual, but most of them end up being lesbian or gay. So to block their sexual awakening when specifically they might have a more difficult root into their sexual self because they're sexual minorities. It's it's a profoundly authoritarian thing to do, to come in and block somebody's development. We have no idea of, you know, the ache you feel during t- adolescence, that kind of loneliness. It's the beginning of our search for an, a mate. It's the beginning of our search for for love. It's it's the most profound changes happen between the ages roughly 10 to 20. And to stop that development, I think we're going to look back in horror that we we tried and we succeeded in stopping people's sexual development. We all know getting older comes with its share of aches and pains, but it doesn't mean you have to just accept it. Let me tell you about William from California and his relief factor story. William had debilitating back pain and tried all sorts of treatments with no luck. His sister insisted he give Relief Factor a try, and after a month, his back pain was gone. William says, I don't know how Relief Factor works, but it is a miracle. If you are living with aches and pain, 
See how Relief Factor, a daily drug-free supplement, could help you feel and live better every day. Relief Factor is 100% tested and packaged in the USA, trusted for more than a decade by more than a million pain-free customers. Say goodbye to aches and pains. Get started today with the Relief Factor 3-Week Quick Start Kit. It's just $19.95 and it comes with a feel better or your money back guarantee. Visit relieffactor.com or call 1-800-4-RELIEF. That's 1-800, the numeral 4, RELIEF. Live the life you love with Relief Factor. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.